Marketing. While modern consumers hate the idea of shoving ads and product placements in our face, marketing has played a pivotal role in elevating brands from the unknown to the all too popular. Let's face it, without ads, how would you even know what to buy? Yeah, you could do research now, but before the internet, all we had were the commercials and ads big companies wanted us to see. Welcome to Console Stackup, I'm Brando K, and today we're going to take a quick educated look at the NES's American marketing campaign, which changed the gaming landscape as we know it. After the effects of the game crash in 83, Nintendo had to find a way to market their new console in America. Now, during the early 80s, home console gaming was nearly non-existent and arcade gaming was booming. The only reason they had a real chance of making it big was due to the brand success of the arcade cabinets such as Donkey Kong, Popeye, and Punch-Out. In order to tap into the home console market, they went to strike a deal with the market leader during the time, Atari. Of course, Atari had heard of Nintendo's arcade cabinet success and knew that the Famicom was doing very well overseas. So Nintendo offered to sell their Famicom console under the Atari label in order to tap into their distribution centers and existing brand loyalty. Though the brand was tarnished, it was still better than nothing. Can you imagine the Atari Nintendo? During this time, the Atari 7800 was under production, so it was a win-win for Atari. Either their own console would sell well, or the Nintendo would. In the end, market cannibalization wasn't a big deal. However, while these arrangements were being made, in a move to increase Nintendo's brand awareness around the nation, they decided to license their most popular IP, Donkey Kong, to a few other publishers. Donkey Kong was released for a ton of consoles during this time. Prior to 85, Donkey Kong was released for the Apple II. Atari 2600, Commodore 64, VIC-20, Intellivision, TI-99, and ColecoVision to name a few. Thing was, Nintendo never told Atari about these deals. In fact, during the Computer Entertainment Show of 1983, Atari stumbled upon ColecoVision and saw not only Donkey Kong playing on their console, but listed as a pack-in title for their release. Obviously, Atari was livid and ended up canceling their deal with Nintendo, leaving them out to dry. So you're probably asking yourself, wait, what's the Consumer Electronics Show? Well, the CES was held biannually and acted as one of the most important tech trade shows in the world. In January, it was held in Vegas, while in June, it moved to Chicago. About half the floor space was dedicated to gaming, while the other half was dedicated to TVs, cassettes, PCs, and more. Anyway, the CES was a big deal at the time. People would spend up to a million dollars per booth in order to get journalists to really eat up their presentation. Nintendo unveiled their own console in the wake of the failed Atari deal as the AVS, or Advanced Video Game System. Designed by Lance Barr, the AVS was released with around 25 games, mouse, keyboard, and even a music keyboard. However, no store or media outlet wanted in. Nintendo had to rethink their marketing strategy. Nobody wanted to take a risk on selling a game console in the wake of the video game crash. So at the next CES, Nintendo released their console alongside Rob and a Zapper Gun, retooled from their existing arcade games. They named their new console the NES and got rid of the cassette deck and keyboard. Nintendo's goal was to disassociate themselves with the negative stigma gaming had. By including Rob, it looked more like a toy. And by calling the NES a control deck and fashioning it to look like a VCR, they hoped the stain of video games wouldn't be apparent. And to be fair, when the NES was compared to other consoles, it really stood out. Again, people liked the idea of the console, but were very hesitant. The NES needed a strategy of attack. The Nintendo Invasion of America was directed by Peter Main and Bill White. With sales of the Famicom doing very well in Japan, Nintendo of America had a lot of money to spend where they saw fit. With a $5 million budget per commercial, Nintendo spent five times more than the next game ad. To quote Bill White, it's a software-driven business. 
The job is not so much to increase long-term brand equity as it is to build excitement around the next hit. And who were these hits aimed at? Kids. Nintendo understood parents bought the games, but kids controlled their wallets. So Nintendo decided the best target demographic would be kids ages 6 to 14, thus all their marketing reflected this. Additionally, Nintendo also included a money back guarantee, allowing for free returns and refunds for the store and consumers in order to move consoles, something no other company had done before. So, if the kid had a problem, the parents could return it with no harm done. And while Nintendo dominated this segment of kids to early teens in the 90s, Nintendo wanted to widen their grip. How did they do this? Well, instead of appealing to too many groups at once, they partnered up with an existing brand that already owned the age groups between 12 and 34. Can you guess what? Nintendo spent $10 million to put their brand on over 2 billion cans of Pepsi. But Nintendo didn't stop there. In a dealer loader deal, Nintendo placed their characters on various Tide detergent. But the next deal is what really put them on the spot. Nintendo's success with the previous two ventures allowed them to cut a deal with McDonald's to make their Happy Meal Nintendo toys. To quote Nintendo, the name of the game is games. Marketing partnerships and ads were good and all, but Nintendo had to back up their claim for games. They decided to release Super Mario Bros. as a pack-in title with the NES. Now, the decision to do this was met with a lot of hesitation. Nintendo knew Mario was their best game at the time, and packaging it in was a risky move. By selling it separately, they could easily make $60 a game, but they could only move as many copies of the game as there were consoles on the market. So the executive decision was made to make it a pack-in title in order to move more consoles. Nintendo knew that while first-party games were important, they couldn't make all the games themselves, so they formed partnerships with four game producers, Capcom, Konami, Data East, and Bandai. In order to prevent another crash from occurring with their own console, which many believe was due to the influx of terrible games on the market, Nintendo released a lockout security chip on the NES. This ensured only quality games could run on the system. With good games in hand and a sound console to boot, Nintendo needed a good distributor to help move their products. So they turned to the World of Wonder, the biggest and hottest toy store of the 80s. They hit it big with the Teddy Ruxpin Bear and decided to also take on the NES. World of Wonder took Nintendo on, but decided to severely limit what Nintendo was able to provide in showing preferential treatment to Ruxpin, their hottest seller. Regardless, after their first few years, the NES sold like hotcakes at WoW and at other small retailers. And before long, the Ruxpin Bear wasn't selling anymore. World of Wonder tried to make a deal with Nintendo, but by then the NES was selling so quickly, other major distributors like Toys R Us and Babbage's had jumped aboard. By this time, Nintendo characters started popping up on game boards, lunchboxes, and more. So all of this seemed like a good start, but Nintendo needed to find a way to get kids to learn about their upcoming games. Nintendo Power Well, in the beginning it was just called the Nintendo Fun Club News. A 12-page, two-colored magazine released in 87 given to players who returned a warranty card. However, by winter demand had increased so much for this gaming magazine that Nintendo decided to increase it to 32 pages. By 88, Howard Phillips, who headed the Nintendo Fun Club News, was put in charge of the Nintendo Power magazine, which released once every other month with hundreds of pages in game tips, guides, and upcoming hits. Phillips made it a point not to include any ads, keep the price at $15 a month, and within the year it was the best-selling kid magazine worldwide. By 1990, the issue had 6 million subscriptions and acted not only as a source of revenue, but as a way to gauge interest in upcoming products. Now what really set these magazines apart were the gaming tips. Let's be real, some of these old NES games were very cryptic, and before the advent of the internet, these gaming secrets, hints, and tips were in high demand, especially at the playground. Nintendo picked up on this and decided to release a Nintendo Power Line in order to take on user requests. What started as six people in a call distribution center quickly evolved into a 500-person operation who answered 150,000 calls a week. That's roughly a call every couple of seconds. And while this was originally free, Nintendo soon switched to a pay-per-minute model with a three-minute maximum. Nintendo at its roots invested in phone services, magazines, TV ads, store promotions, and mega partnerships with other companies. Are we missing anything? Oh yeah. Nintendo also had a slew of Saturday morning cartoons that aired on NBC. The three most popular ones were Captain N, Super Mario World, and The Legend of Zelda. These shows were so popular, they retained the top three spots during the early 90s for most watched program on NBC Saturday mornings. In all honesty, the shows weren't all that good, but because of the gaming content, audiences ate them up. 
And then came The Wizard. What's The Wizard? Maybe the greatest gaming hype movie of all time. Acting as a glorified extended release trailer for Super Mario Bros. 3, The Wizard followed a young boy who entered a Nintendo gaming tournament in order to play the unreleased Mario 3 and get some sweet prize winnings. Overall, Nintendo's marketing strategy made them one of the biggest names in the business. From a dilapidated market, they had revitalized an industry and changed the gaming landscape forever. At least in Japan and the US, European markets didn't see nearly as much advertising or marketing which proved to hurt their sales a lot, which explains why Sega dominated in the European markets. But with all that fame and success in the US, Nintendo had a couple of setbacks, mostly in the legal arena. Next time in our final part of the NES analysis, we're going to take a look at the legal battles Nintendo had to contest with just to stay alive. I'm Brando K at Console Stack Up, and I'll see you guys again next time. Hey you behind the screen, did you like what you saw? If you did, why not consider subscribing, leaving a comment, or maybe even sharing this with your friends? The more people that learn about this channel, the bigger it will grow and it will be all thanks to you.